Hello there. Welcome to another lecture. This time lecture LT3, which is an architectural theory lecture called Meaning and Architectural Form number one, embedded in the Architecture Design Studio 3. This is focusing on postmodernism architect architects, namely Venturi, Venturi's wife, Scott Brown, Charles Jenks, New York Five, California Grays. We will observe and read on principles and concepts behind precedence and critical thinking. And we focus from writings from 1955 to 1996 for postmodernism, which is a movement against modernism. And these are some of the literature that you can read up on. We focus on an era which spans 19. 55 to 1996. And you can see that clearly in the idealist tradition, Venturi is somewhere between 1960s and 70s. And it started at the end of the international style. And there were not much things happening at that time, but later there was a clear movement against modernism because some of the things that were pointed out was the failure of mod the modern movement. We can refer again to that, but let us also understand this quote from Saussure, who is basically focusing on semiology. In 1916, his quote, in his course in general linguistics, he postulated the existence of a general science of science or semiology, of which linguistics would form only one part. So the other parts are, could be architecture or art and other cultural uh, significance. In fact, the word significance, if you read further the quote, is of a big deal, that there is a system of significance or signification, yeah? And I would like to focus on the next slide, please. Now, if we're talking about system of significance, yeah, we're talking about conservation movement. The conservation movement where buildings such as this high school in Edinburgh is protected by law to not be destroyed, to be preserved, until whenever, now partly because of tourism, but there is a strong backing of the law to protect the system of significance in conservation. So some significance, some forms of architecture are more important than others, are much more beautiful than others. So there's a value system as well. Now, the, the root of it is semiology or the system of science. So this is what we're trying to introduce. Before we talk about postmodernism, we're going to try to introduce this, this uh, definition of semiology and examples relating to it. In 1972, there is a writing by Venturi and Scott Brown Base on a trip that both of them did bringing nine architecture students and two planning students and two graphic design students to Las Vegas. As we know, Las Vegas is, um, is uh, famous for casinos, yeah? Uh, and there is one main street called the Las Vegas Street, which has signboards and architectural facades of the various casinos prominently um, is part of the strip, yeah? So people want that. People want popular culture to be prominent. And forms and meanings could be from people themselves, not necessarily from architects. Why should architects be uh, the, um, the one that dictate what forms should be designed for uh, the cities and towns. 
Venturi wrote a book earlier in the 1960s, which we will talk about later. But we have an example from learning from Las Vegas. And he took a picture of this building. This is the building. It's not a duck sculpture, but it is a building of an actual duck, which is actually an egg shop that houses, that sells, that sells eggs and presumably duck eggs in 1931. So this concept of duck architecture, which somehow this became duck architecture, became a symbol of communities and landmarks of architectural feats throughout America. So they call it Kirsch, Kirsch design. What, what is all, the meaning of all this? You know, uh, I'm not gonna do a duck architecture, you know, but then what's wrong with that? That was the question that was asked by Venturi. Now other protagonists such as Charles Jenks also wrote on semiology and architecture. And these were the points that he pointed out, the, the meaning of architecture, the motivation or determinant behind it. And in the case, an example is this person in a raincoat. The purpose of this raincoat is very clear to not get wet if you're in a rain because of the hoodie is have a cantilever there, extra protection from the rain to, so that your face doesn't get wet as you can see that. Uh, and only your fingers are shown and basically you're, you're very safe there in terms of being waterproof. But this piece of clothing, a piece of fashion, a piece of garment can be of a different use another time. And it's based on a different motivation. And you haven't seen such a hoodie before in maybe people who are walking around wanting to look um, anon not anonymous, but um, wanting not to be seen or a musician on a stage or, you know, this could have a different purpose, purpose of, of uh, want to be hidden away and disguised away many other purposes. It could be a fashion statement. So another one of the, the things that Jenks was talking about is a sign situation. And in this triangle, which has language at one pinnacle, thought, another end, and reality in a triangular um, relationship may not have to be connected with each other. What you say and what you think may not have to be, the reality may not have to be connected to the thought or the language. So this is what semiological or semiology is about, the study of science. There's also two other things, which context and metaphor, multivalence and univalence, which we will touch upon later. Let's talk, talk about the first point, yeah? Meaning, inevitable yet denied. So in what Jang said is that the idea that any form in the environment or sign in language is motivated or capable of being motivated any form at all. Forms can come alive or fall into bits. And another view is whenever a new form is invented, inevitably it will acquire a new meaning. The same as the raincoat. It was invented for that purpose, but it can acquire a new meaning. So do a traditional house form, such as the vernacular Malay house. Previously, it was designed as such for a different function. Now it is a homestay. With the green fields, you can make it as a tourist product. Previously, it was a house for a family with a family unit and going about in their daily lives. Yeah? But now it become a recreational um, habitat. So, for example, we talk about the Parthenon and how the Parthenon's form, the first one, the original, changes the suit to different functions. We talked about it earlier, of the school and the town hall. There were these, these, these uh, similar forms in terms of the colonnade, the portico, the pediment, you know, the, the, um, the tree, 
tiers of the base, middle, and the top. Even more so, the high school, which looks like as if it's on a mountain with, you know, uh, a, a very higher base, in fact. So a variation of its, uh, the, the predecessor, which is the Parthenon. So when, when we talk about the sign situation, just now, what was it? Language, thought, and reality. So the language we use here is motifs from a classical tradition. There's a pediment, is that a pediment? And there's an entrance right in the middle. Is that a chimney at the back? So, so there is as if a suggestion, as if that it is a house, is it? It is quite ambiguous, yeah? And the reality that it is a house for his mother, but the language, is it trying to be playing with a certain language? And in terms of thought, it's not clear what is the entrance. Is that the entrance? You know, is that the living room? You know, the, the clarity of what it is, it's not very clear. But when you look at the hill, uh, the school on the hill, you can know that that's the main entrance where the portico is, where the main pavilion is inviting you in or the other buildings. So classical tradition, although they adopt the classical forms and use it for different functions, this one, the postmodernists such as Venturi, they played with it. So it's more of the mannerists, they call it. They're playing with different elements in whatever way they want to. So a conclusion from meaning uh, that is mentioned just now, um, any form in the environment is motivated and any form being invented will acquire meaning. So the meaning can change. Um, and the wary of metaphors and symbolism. We will talk about metaphors earlier uh, where Hans Mayer referred to the League of Nations building where um, he was critical about how modern architects use metaphors. Now we, we know about John Erdzen's Sydney Opera House, the use of metaphor in that, in that building. What about the other buildings in the modern era, especially those which are sort of curvilinear forms and justification using metaphors. So that was a suggestion by Hans Mayer. <clears throat> the sign situation, we talk about Venturi's mother's house. Something may mean different things to different individuals, hence multivalent. So what Venturi wanted to put across was that the idea of multivalence and also the semiological triangle where one area does not determine the other, yeah? So in context and metaphor, what we have here is Louis Armstrong with a trumpet or some musical instrument, a wind musical instrument. And we have on the right side is a, um, the turbine factory. Do we know what is the context in each of this uh, photograph? Do we know what is the metaphor behind each of this photograph? In these cases, what uh, are there differences between these photographs? But I like to concentrate on the first one, which is about jazz and the association of jazz with Louis Armstrong, the trumpeter. Is, is it a good memory or a bad memory? Is association of the bad and good of that particular image? It could be bad or it could be good. And so there is also that's depending on the context of that time, or when you first saw the photograph or the memory of that, or is it to do with the music that has been played at that time with a certain setting? So this is some of the thing regarding context and metaphor of the song or the sound that symbolizes something in your life or have a meaning in your life. So architecture can be like that. When you talk about uh, the right, which is architecture rather than music, of a turbine factory. And what is, does it allude to the met metaphor or symbolize, symbolism of the area around it, which is the context in terms of the place, which is 
not in the middle of the city, it's in fact in the rural area. So in a, in a way, did Peter Barron's wanted to show as if it is a barn. A barn, yeah, where you know where you have places where you have animals in, but this is obviously a factory where you have turbine. So we did talk about whether it's classical that he's trying to do a take on classical gable end of the pediment, but then again we talk about whether it is a metaphor of something else, and in that context that we talk about. So. So the, the meaning about good and, uh, and bad architecture or good and bad objects or images is one of the issues of semiology. Another thing is the point of multivalent and univalent uh, where um, in here you can see Michael Graves drawing of the Plotchek house below and in pencil and colored pencil, and also the realization of the building. The evo it's quite evocative, the, or it's the rendering and the drawing um, in pencil color is quite, you know, um, it, it has some sort of mannerism, some sort of like what um, a Venturi did with the Vana Venturi house you know, using classical elements, the keystone device as part of the gateway entrance. Um, the implementation of it is different there, but the base of middle, of, of, bot, of, of base, middle and top uh, in classical tradition, but when translated in um, plast, uh, painted on uh, plaster on uh, materials, it feels a bit awkward in terms of cardboard. It's cardboard-like. You can see the plants on the right. Now, um, multivalence in a way that um, the postmodernist architects, such as Michael Graves, wanted to play with different elements. It's just as a, going back to the triangle of thoughts, reality, and language. This is a house, and this was you trying to do. Um, some some sort of monument or some sort of what is the language? It doesn't feel like a house, isn't it? I mean, it feels like a gateway to some sort of visitor center or something. Or, or um, so you know that play that they did uh, is not something that is clear what they have done. It's a play at the end of the day. So when we get to this Coney Island hot dog stand, it's similar to the duck architecture that we saw earlier, popular architecture. It's much more direct, isn't it? I would even say this is univalent. You can see straight on the object, this is a place where I can get hot dogs, as opposed to the earlier one where, what is this place when you come across it? Oh, it's a house, really. You know, oh, then there is the gateway. So, so this it gives a message. It tells a story that maybe the story is not direct. Yeah. Again, this is a summary of the context and metaphor between opposition or association, good or bad, and so on, and the multivalence and univalence. One cannot separate the method from the purpose. Equal concern of form for form function and technique, this ambiguity creates a multivalent experience. And there are some that Jenks mentioned also do those multivalent and univalence in terms of Le Corbusier's work, Alto and Archigraph. So in his book, Abstract Representation in the 1970s, um, Jenks questions uh, posed on the role of the architect in a Pluralist society. It, it is architecture only under the jurisdiction of um, the architect. Do people have a say in what architecture forms should be like? Examples of uh, Jefferson's uh, house in in Washington, as you can see. So. 
some of these questions influence the New York Five and the California Greys. We, in particular, we would like to bring up this group of architects, one based in the East Coast and one based in the West Coast of, of the United States of America. When in 1969, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, MoMA, calls together a handful of five architects preparing the projects and bringing to the public the work of a hoped New York school. So there's a school, a tradition, a critical discourse, which starts around the theoretical and building work of the five American architects, which we are calling the whites, Peter Eisenman, John Hedjuk, Richard Meyer, Michael Graves, and Charles Gorton protagonist of this architectural debate in the words of these critics. And then a few years earlier in 1966, okay, that was earlier than 1969, the same mama printed gentle manifesto written by Robert Venturi, opening the door to a gray practice, mix of complexity and contradiction. So this is more in what's happening in the, in the West, which is characterized by more grayish, much more colorful, much different sort of architecture than the whites on the East Coast. So the grays, the architecture is more immune to the profusion of discursive tools found in the middle of ideological debate and summarized in the image published in the magazine A plus U, where a revived Le Corbusier preparing his Senate Sinecolo placed himself in the center of these two groups. The oppositions between whites and grays were not vacuous as capable of creating contradictions as in the language, as in the architectural construction, true compositional procedures, just similar. So we introduce you to New York Five, Eisenman, Grays, Mayor, Hedge, Guav, me. One thing is, prevalent is the characteristic of their architecture that is deemed to be um, or mentioned to be cardboard architecture. So this is something that you can imagine, it's almost like it's made of cardboard in the sense that it's always a white cubic rectilinear cube form. And these are the, you know, essentially, it's almost unfinished, yeah? It's look like a model, yeah? We, we, we come back to the idea that architects create models, yeah? And again, it is, um, it is true to these group of architects. So in which Maya did the Smith House built between 65 and 67, he wanted to create a programmatic separation between public and private areas. This is how the house maintains some element of enigmatic mystery and surprise, whereas most houses put on a welcoming show on the front and have the private rooms enclosed in the rear. Smith House takes an opposite route, the street facing side of the house where visitors enter through that ramp appears as an unassuming opaque white box punctured with dark glass openings. This is the private side of the house, encompassing a series of close cellular spaces. Whereby in front is much more open and facing uh, the ocean. You can see in the plan when you enter, all the enclosed spaces at the back and it looks like not really welcoming, but in front, it is focused on to the sea in which as much views as possible, except for the chimney that you can take. <clears throat> So the intention of the architect is, what is the intention of the architect here is to, to, the, the, is to do with program. So programmatic means these living areas, dining, um, living room, and the front areas are really open up. South facing actually, so there's not much heat. And the ones at the back is closed up, but you enter from the back. So that's the, 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 the how they justify um, this design of this house by Richard Meyer. Peter Eisenman 
adapted a version of the international style he calls cardboard architecture. So Peter Eisman is the one that actually mentioned this word. Uh, although Richard Meyer does have cardboard architecture look. Um, the modernist work of the 1920s and 30s of Le Corbusier and Giuseppe Terragni have been inspirational in development of Eisenman's formal vocabulary. His buildings white or white and gray with the addition of a limited use of primary colors. More recently have the feeling of cardboard models. This results not only from their color, but more importantly, from the visual suppression of all structural detailing. You can't see any detailing. It's probably tim uh, the timber studs or whatever, but no, you just whitewash it. Yeah. The uniform texture, the walls and shallow interior space. Eisenman has written that cardboard is, con cardboard is connectative of less mass, less texture, less color, and ultimately less concern for these. It is closest to the abstract idea of plan. It is Eisenman's intention that deep structure, although not explicitly apparent, would be apprehended by the viewer, thereby intensifying the viewer's understanding of architectural space. So details were not important. Space allude to details and volumes allude to space. So it's almost negative, the space. So in Peter Eisenman's professional activity, architecture criticism and theory have been integral with the production of built form. In the 1960s, he developed a theory of architecture antithetical to most modernist theory, initially published in the Corusive Matter in Five Architects of 1972. Eisenman's writing in polemical buildings have placed him in the forefront of the architectural dialogue of the last decade. So, Eisenman has developed an architectural theory that divorces the building and its conceptualization from traditional cultural and pragmatic concerns. He's interested in exploring the inherent nature of architecture divorce from the specificity of program. The nature of plane, line or column and the volume is of primary concern as is the relationship among these elements. This relationship is organized by a rule system which Eisenman, to borrow an analog from linguistic theory, has called deep structure. Eisenman, profoundly influenced by linguistic theory, has vigorously maintained that architecture is a language whose surface variations as those in language are dominated by an underlying structure. So he's interested in the workings of how he manipulates the architectural space and volumes and he wasn't so much concerned with the program. So the program is secondary. It's just almost like a model that he's creating. Um, so as you can see, he did house one, two, three, four, five, and to 11, I think. <clears throat> and he's a good example of a de deconstruction. Um, and deconstruction comes from language, from linguistics, where he, he looks at architecture like a language, like almost like a combination of different things of planes and lines and, and, and he could create different uh, textures. It's, it came from the white cutboard, white and gray to more shades of gray, a bit more grid and cages, and you know, he just added a few much, a, a more bits of architectural language. So that's a link to the video on Eisenman's talk in 2013, but he, he didn't, this is an experiment. So later he, he contextualized a bit more about his architecture, as you can see. Michael Graves, the other of uh, New York Five, we have Maya, Eisenman, now we have Graves. And he is more of the metaphorical architect among the five. And when you see his later work, it became more and more symbolical. And not so the duck architecture, but almost there, but not there. I mean, his symbolism is using all this 
thinking get us to think about what it is really the function of the building. But here in his house in 1969, this is the beginning period, uh, Benesaraf House and Hanselman House, the, the best example of this time. They're still focusing on Corbusier, you know, all these three architects, they were, they take, they take on Corbusier where he, he left with the Le, Villa Savoy house. And because they got to do housing project, uh, uh, houses as well, they played with these planes, lines in different ways. So when Eisenman looking at the underlying structure, graves look at more of metaphors, like for example, the yellow um, painted uh, frame that comes from the top there and the blue and the red railing. This, this suggests a bit about um, Riedveld's house in terms of elementarism, the colors of the style architecture. But, you know, the frames are not really cut rectangular. There are some which is curvilinear and uh, rounded at parts and comes out like as if, you know, it doesn't have to hold anything, but it comes out and create a frame. So it's playing with the, how people go to the building and how certain things are coming out of it, which suggests a playfulness is suggested where you go around the house and you think about what's this about, the different colors that is put in the building in different parts of the building. So, so still the cubistic sense is there. And when you look at the plan, it does have that rectilinear form, which is the major one with a bit of curves. And, but it's not a straightforward building. It does uh, play, it does, it's quite functional in a way. Unlike Eisenman, which is totally not really caring about the programs at all or the functions much. But Charles Guathme, uh, another of the New York Five, intended the house to be a sculpture on the site. And he approached this by carving out primitive forms such as cubes to create different spaces. The carving of the spaces was de determined by the responses to the site solar orientation program is such is more straightforward. Yeah, Charles got me, but it's still um, playing with the lacobre sort of form plasticity in terms of a cardboard house still feeling of that, you know, the nature of the cardboard house is also, they use a lot of timber and painted on it. And um, this is quite programmatic and quite reasonable in terms of the utility of it, but still playing with solid and voids and the volume. And you can't see the, de you can't also feel the details as much, like similar to the others as well. Same as the California Grace, actually, those guys in the West Coast, basically Charles Moore, Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, his wife, in the words of Robert Stern, Vincent Scully, plus a Michael Graves, which is in between. We, we think of Michael Graves, it could be here or there, but Michael Graves predominantly in the East, searching a compromise between the white and gray. So there are others as well, apart from this. Back to the 60s, we talk about Robert Venturi, where he argues that in every discipline, complexity and contradiction present within the field have been acknowledged, starting from Godel's proof of ultimate inconsistency in mathematics to T.S. Eliot's analysis of difficult poetry. However, predominant architectural movement at the time, modernism had, was still loyal to its puritanical moral language. The truth is in modern architecture. We were trying to debate about that. This, the, all this is not true architecture. They're playing around. And Venture believes that emerging new programmatic, structural, and mechanical complexities, the modernist approach can no longer maintain its consistency. But then you debate. That no, and in the works of the whites in New York, New York Five, 
and the grays, you find these development in terms of thought and energy on what modernism is, a reaction to modernism, a reaction to the international style. So this is a picture of the Las Vegas Strip and which I mentioned earlier. And on the bottom is how the figure ground of the forms of the different casinos maintain and articulate the street or the strip, yeah? In his first book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, published in 1966 by the MoMA again, Venturi posed the question, is not Main Street almost all right? He was arguing what he called the messy vitality of the built environment. As he puts it, we were calling for an architecture that promotes richness and ambiguity over unity and clarity, contradiction and redundancy over harmony and simplicity. I mean, the truth is out there that human nature loves the messy vitality. He was challenging modernism with the multiple solutions available from history the history defined as relating not only to the specific building site, but the history of all architecture. He wanted architecture to deal with the complexities of the city to become more contextual. So some of the things, metaphors and context, we mentioned about semiology that was important. It would be impossible to discuss Robert Venturi's writing without mentioning his famous response, less is a bore to modernist Nice. And the group of people, the California Grays, include Charles Moore. It is one of the important buildings by Charles Moore, which is Sea Ranch. Designed as a team that would be the first of Moore's four collaborative practices. One can see the origins of the rhetoric that Moore would explore the rest of his career in scenographic architecture and dilatory, deceptively casual prose. It's almost like vernacular architecture, following the lay of the land and the slope. From the inward intensity of his own house, scattered from Orinda, California, to Austin, Texas, to New Haven, connected to the outward urban exuberance of the Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans and Love Joy Fountain in Portland, Oregon. Moore was working out ideas about how architecture should relate to history, how interior should, could be stimulating stage sets for human interaction, and how public life need, needed to be framed for our car-centric technological age, all themes as relevant now as they were 50 years ago. This is the Orinda House where he mentioned about the different stage sets, the stage set for the living room, the stage set for the dining room and so on. And, and there is a structure within the structure, like hidden architecture. And this is a stage set that he did for Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans using classical motifs. Charles wanted to give people a chance to put their own things in and to discover different qualities in a place than the first and most obvious one, says uh, the critique. Rather than reducing architecture to something completely minimal that people wandered in around, Halprin, a frequent collaborator, thought more could have as easily become a landscape architect. Um, he wrote also that his houses were like gardens, gardens of fantasy and delight. So the quality of discovery had been Moore's calling card since he designed his first house for himself in Orinda, which centered on two sky-lit ediculi, truncated pyramids, each supported by four chunky columns. Outside the ediculi, which were inspired conceptually by the John Summerson book, Heavenly Mansions and physically by the pavilions of one time teacher Louis Kahn's Trenton Bath House, sprouted spaces Moore would describe unpoetically as saddlebags. Nooks, porches, lofts, and shelves designed to create room for collections and hobbies and shelter for different moods and stages for more intimate conversation. So, this is the Orinda House, and you can see the truncated pyramid roof which is trying to create those different parts of the house to be intimate. Robert Stern did with symmetry and classical proportions as with the Disney 
building that he did. And this goes back to the more populist, the more uh, architecture with the metaphors, of a wizard's hat or something like that at the, por at the porch. And architecture is broken down into more smaller bits and combine the elements together in sort of a scenographic way. So as we come to the conclusion of postmodernism architecture as a reaction to late uh, to modernism architecture, which we will, uh, we had a, a bit of it earlier on in international style. We can also refer to Charles Jenks' uh, writings on this, influential architecture critic and historian, and the six traditions of architecture on his, in his book, Modern Movements in Architecture. So we have this links. We also have the Saucer Code. And then your homework is, for the next group, the homework is, what is the difference between functionalism and brutalism? We saw functionalism and we saw examples of brutalism. Are they almost the same? When you look at this two architecture, are they the same or are they different? Okay, so they do belong in different decades. And the one on the right seems to allude to some sort of machine or the one on the left is actually a machine. Remember the ship's crews, the, li um, the liner, I think, yeah, metaphor or analogy. What about the right? Are these modern architecture or are these postmodernism architecture? For example, discuss these two buildings. And if the one on the left is functionalism, the one on the right is brutalism or vice versa. What do you think? Or that is unnecessary to even discuss. Cardboard architecture. What is your opinion on the postmodernism of the grays and the whites? In particular, when you just depose Venturi's house for his mother and Richard Meyer's house, this uh, Richard Meyer's house called the Smith house. So the entrance are different. What are the differences? Are they both programmatic? Programmatically, is that a difference in terms of the program and how it is designed in plan or they are actually the same? So what are your opinions of the grays and the whites we represented by these two halves? So that is all. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>